Okay, so we're back here uh, talking about, uh, still talking about ventilation here. In this case, we're gonna start talking about fish again, but very special fish, these are lungfish. Uh, lungfish are air breathers, right? At least partially air breathing. Um, and they're going to ventilate their lung, right? Which is here, sort of the inside of a lung here. Uh, we'll talk about this complexity in a second. But they're gonna do so using basically the same method that our bony fish did before. They're going to gulp air and they're going to swallow it. They're going to force it from their mouth back. Okay. Only instead of forcing it back across a gill, they can do that. But instead of across a gill, they're going to force it into this little outpocketing of the stomach. Sometimes it even is just the stomach, right? Depending on um, where we are in terms of history, where we are in terms of lung development. But the lung is an outpocketing of that stomach. And so they're going to be essentially swallowing air, right? This method of ventilation, because it involves using the mouth to pump air backward, is called a buccal pump. Sometimes you'll hear people say this is buccal. I think that sounds dumb. You can say it however you want to. Uh, but buccal pump is the means of ventilation. Now, inside this lung, again, remember, we want to have as much surface area as we possibly can. So we're going to subdivide the in inside of this little outpocketing, this little pouch, right, with as many of these little trabeculae as we possibly can, these little struts and columns within there, right? And by doing that, we actually create quite a bit of surface area. Right, for us to have gas exchange across that. The sort of next stage in the evolution of the lung, um, we can still see today in uh, modern amphibians, same basic rule holds play here. Uh, now we're gonna see, again, uh, oftentimes more complex lungs, sometimes we have two lungs, a right and a left now, not always, but, but often. Um, but again, we're going to be stuck with that same kind of internal anatomy where we've got these little trabeculae, but essentially one big interconnected chamber. And we call these uni, as in one, cameral, as in chamber, unicameral lungs. They can be subdivided with little trabeculae, little partitions of the inside, but they're still essentially one big chamber, okay? Um, and there's a variety of complexity we see in modern amphibians. The best, sort of in terms of complexity, we see it in frogs and toads. Uh, obviously, um, as larvae, right, of both frogs and salamanders, um, and in some cases also the adults of salamanders, a respiratory structure is a gill because we're, we're fully aquatic at that point. Now the means of ventilation here is going to be essentially the same as it was in the lungfish, right? We're still going to use a, a buccal pump, only now we've added a little bit of complexity, okay? Now we've got a specialized pathway outside of the digestive pathway for our lung, we've got a specialized little branching off, okay? And some special structures that go with that. So the first structure is going to be a larynx, okay? And in a thing like a frog, that larynx is mostly there to house this little opening here called the glottis. And this glottis acts like a sphincter that can close off the airway. We can essentially prevent air from entering or leaving the lung by closing that glottis. Now, again, we rely on a buccal pump here, but because that glottis is there, we have a slightly more complicated ventilation cycle, okay? So what happens is we fill the oral chamber here by, not by opening the mouth and swallowing, but by taking the pouch area here, the, the floor, the gular region, if you prefer, of the frog and by lowering it, right? And if you guys have seen frogs breathe, they kind of do this little thing where the pouch comes out like here, right? As they do that, they create suction, okay? So air floods in through the nostril, 
Frogs aren't mouth breathers, unlike some people. Air comes in through the nostril, fills this chamber. Okay. At this point, the glottis is closed. Right? Then they're going to open the glottis, and the lung, which is elastic, is going to rebound like a rubber band. Right? And that's going to push air out the glottis and out the mouth and out the nostril. Now, this stale air and this fresh air are separated a little bit. Fresh air is mostly down here, the stale air is mostly up here, but they do mix. There's a little bit of mixing going on. Then they close the nostril and they bring the, the floor of their mouth up, right? And that forces air, that pumps air, right, from the buccal cavity into the lung. And then they're going to do it again and again and again and again. Now, of course, because we do see these big ontogenetic changes, these big shifts in how these animals respire, uh, we are going to see differences in where oxygen and carbon dioxide come in and leave. So at the earliest stage, right, when we're fully aquatic, we don't have lungs, right? They're beginning to grow, but they're not functional. So all of our oxygen here and all of our carbon dioxide have to pass out through either the skin or through the gills. As we get a little bit older, as we develop the lungs and they can be useful, we start to use them a little bit for carbon dioxide, not a lot, um, but they actually take over in terms of gills for oxygen uptake. Skin is still most important but they've overtaken the gills by this point. Once we are now rid of our gills, we're not necessarily an adult frog, we're, we'll call a froglet, which is kind of adorable. Um, we're not reproductively, we're not reproductive age yet, but we are, we got four limbs, we have no gills. The gills obviously therefore, because they're gone, have no role whatsoever, right? The lungs have taken over Oxygen uptake for the most part, the skin still does about 20%, but the lungs have, have taken over. But the skin remains very important for carbon dioxide exchange. The lungs, even in an adult frog, really never do much of that. For non avian reptiles, I remember that birds are dinosaurs and therefore reptiles. For non avian reptiles, we start to see the development of, in some cases, although not all cases, multi. Cameral lungs, right? Multiple chambers, multiple subdivisions, not just simply trabeculae, okay, but actual individual separate little rooms within there. The other big thing we see here once we get into uh, reptiles and, and mammals too um, is that we go away from a buccal pump. Right, which is a positive pressure kind of thing, to it's an A, believe it or not, aspiration. Okay, the lungs fill by suction rather than being pumped. So in a buccal pump in our frogs and our, our lungfish, right, the lungs are filled by the buccal chamber forcing air backwards. Here, we're going to use expansion of the thoracic cavity, the rib cage, okay? because now for the first time we have mobile ribs. We're going to use expansion of the thoracic cavity to suck air in rather than forcing it backward. Okay, so that's another big change. So I hope this works. A little video here. We've got several little videos here that are fun. Um, here we've got a lizard breathing. And the way that the lizards are going to breathe is they're going to have what are called intercostal muscles. I guess I better write that out too. Uh, these are intercostal. They are muscles that go between the ribs and move them. Okay. And as we see this reptile breathe in and out, pay attention here to the CT uh, image here that's been kind of overlaid on here of these ribs moving as the animal breathes in and out. Right. 
right? Those ribs are entirely responsible for the expansion of the thoracic cavity and the breathing in thereof, and also for the compression, right? And the breathing out. Now, when we get into crocodiles, something special happens. We still have an aspiration pump, right? We still have intercostal muscles that are driving expansion of the thoracic cavity. But we add another special little thing. And that special little thing that we're going to add is this guy right here, the diaphragmatic muscle. It's not a diaphragm, but the diaphragmatic muscle. And what this muscle or muscles are going to do is they're going to be attached to the liver and they're going to be attached to the pelvis. And when they contract, they pull the liver back. And as they pull the liver back, they pull the bottom of the lung down. And by pulling the bottom of the lung down, they increase the surface or they inflate the lung. Okay. And this, so in addition to an aspiration pump, Crocodiles and alligators and gharials and all those fun things also have a piston pump. You know, forgive me, this is like the ninth video I've done this morning, I'm trying to lose my voice. A piston pump on top of that. And that is what we're going to see in this video. So here's a little alligator. We're going to see a side view of him. Um, and I want you to watch right here, right? Here is our liver, this big open space. Here is the lung, and I want you to watch what happens to this solid mass here, this liver, while our alligator is breathing. I'm going to walk into frame here. And watch that liver move back. Inhale. We'll watch that again. So big open area for the lung, breathing out, liver moves forward, liver moves backward, we breathe in. For mammals, uh, we rely on an aspiration pump. Yes, we also have a diaphragm, right? Not a diaphragmatic muscle, but a diaphragm um, that operates very much like the diaphragmatic muscles do. Rather than pulling the liver back, the diaphragm, when it contracts, pushes the liver down, okay? Has the same net effect. It lowers the, the base of the lung, inflates it that way. Um, <clears throat> but lungs are, Mammal lungs are extremely complex. We have a lot of tiny little subdivisions here, both of the airway and of the chambers within them. And we have what's called an alveolar lung. Okay. And the point behind the alveolar, alveolar lung is it takes the notion of being multicameral to its logical extreme. Okay. We have all of these tiny little individual little packages of respiratory membrane, each of which is surrounded by uh, blood vessels of, of kind of this, this massive capillary network within here. If you were to take the alveolar lung and just kind of stretch it out and get the surface area of it, it's about 40 times the surface area of the body uh, packed within the lung. So we are hampered a little bit by having a tidal lung like all of these other animals so far. So we are getting some stale air in there, but we have a massive, massive amount of surface area, so we can still be relatively efficient in terms of gas exchange. Where we're going to go in the third and final video in this series, uh, we're going to see probably the single most efficient, for me, really the, the ultimate lung, um, and that's going to be the lung of a bird. But like I said, that is another video, so I will see you guys in the third installment.